I'm Tim Oates. I'm Group Director of Assessment Research and Development at Cambridge Assessment and I was Chair of the Expert Panel which informed the review of the National Curriculum from 2010 to 2013. When we revised the National Curriculum, we drove many aspects of the review through the study of high-performing jurisdictions around the world. In primary in particular, we discovered that in the nations that had improved fast and from a high base, um, those curricula shared something in common. Children in primary studied fewer things in greater depth. They really mastered fundamental concepts in subjects. Their understanding was really secure. What we wanted to do was to ensure that our national curriculum allowed children to study at the right pace so that they secured deep learning in the central concepts and ideas in the subjects in the national curriculum. This has transformed assessment too Assessment should be focused on whether children have understood these key concepts, these key areas of knowledge and skill, rather than whether they've achieved a particular level or are moving, are moving at a fast pace up through the levels. The expert panel recommended that levels should be dropped in the revised assessment arrangements for the national curriculum, and I think there were really compelling reasons for doing that. The first was that the original model of levels in the TGAT report, some teachers may remember that, was that levels should be used because this would enable kids to progress through education, not being labelled as grade D, grade D, grade D. They could show progress up through the levels, from level one through up four, five, six. And that was laudable, and the original author, Paul Black, now agrees with us in the expert panel that the level system has become over-influenced by other factors. What that means is that kids themselves are labelling themselves as being a particular level. Oh, I'm level three and all my friends are level four. And that's very dysfunctional in terms of learning. That's the first compelling reason, this idea of kids labelling themselves and, and that being inappropriate in learning. It can actually hold back their learning rather than encourage it. The second was undue pace. So the whole of the system has become focused on getting kids to move quickly through the levels. Maximum progress, maximum progress. Well, what we know from study of high-performing jurisdictions around the world, none of which really use a model of levels as we do. Those other jurisdictions, many of whom achieve very high standards and have improved fast, really focus on whether a child has understood the concepts, ideas, key knowledge and skills that are required in a particular phase of their learning and ensuring that they have achieved deep, secure understanding of those things. Now that's not levels, that's really ensuring that f assessment is focused on, on the key content. Um, and that, that's the second reason. Third reason is that it's a very, very odd idea, this idea that somebody is level three. And we had three different models of this in the system. The first was they're level three because they've got a particular score on a national curriculum test. And on that test, you could have picked up a large number of marks on some quite low level items and then a few high level items. But you kind of average out at level three. You're not really level three. Um, it's because your performance is all over the place. So the level is rather odd. Its validity is low. So that's the first meaning that you are level three because you've got a particular score, even though those marks can be, have been derived in very different ways. The second meaning of level three is that in assessing pupil performance, APP, where children and teachers were looking at examples of work, you were level three because your work best matched a particular level descriptor, even though perhaps you hadn't grasped some key ideas. Well, you were moved on inappropriately because you didn't have secure understanding in all the key ideas. So that's a different model of, of level and it has its own educational problems. And then the third meaning of being a particular level was just in, kind of threshold. You know, thank goodness this child is level four at the end of primary, but they're just in level four. Well, those are three different models of levels all coexisting. Teachers meaning different things, the school meaning a different thing to the state. And that's not healthy, it's incoherent. And so we did feel that there were a whole series of compelling reasons why levels should be moved away from in respect of assessment around the national curriculum. The final reason, and it is in a sense a compelling reason in its own right, is that those other nations that have improved fast and achieved very high standards 
and high equity and high enjoyment of their kids in respect of learning don't use levels. And there are schools like the Roxham School in Hertfordshire, Dame Alison Peacock's outstanding school, those schools have never used levels. And they haven't used levels because they feel it conveys the wrong idea of ability. And that was something which shone out of the National Curriculum Review when we looked at the international evidence. In some other nations, high-performing nations, if a teacher is asked, why hasn't this child understood something? The teacher will respond, because I haven't presented it to them in the right way yet. In England, the tendency is to say, well, they haven't understood it because they're level three. It's a totally different model of ability. And Paul Black and I have discussed this, and we feel that we need to switch to a different conception of children's ability. Every child, during primary, being capable of anything, depending on the effort they put in and how it's presented to them. And Levels really has been getting in the way of this. What we want is a model of ability based on each child being capable of anything and us looking progressively through assessment at what ideas a child has understood. Again, a focus on the concepts, the knowledge and the skills, not on a particular Levels label. The new national curriculum really does focus on fewer things in greater depth. Um, and, and if teachers look through the content, um, they will see that it really emphasises key concepts, key ideas, key bodies of knowledge, key skills. And it is chock full of skills. Uh, you know, experimental work in science is in there. Uh, applying mathematics is in there. These are areas of skill as well as knowledge. Um, so the, the changes in assessment really should encourage teachers to focus on assessing whether a child has understood a particular thing, a particular idea, a particular body of knowledge. The arrangement of the primary national curriculum into uh, age-related statements, broken down into years, I believe is very helpful. The law remains that a child has to achieve certain things by the end of the key stage. It's not that the year sequence needs to be followed slavishly, but breaking it down into a year-by-year -year framework does enable the conceptual progression through a particular subject to be made extremely clear. The assessment should therefore focus on has a child understood the key ideas which we're trying to get them to understand and grasp at this particular age. And so the structure, the revised structure of the National Curriculum, I think encourages that. Now an assessment in the classroom and ongoing assessment in the school should really be focused on enabling teachers to select questions that they put to children, to select assessment items or questions which they can put to children to see whether they've really understood the particular idea or grasp a particular body of knowledge. Um, I believe that our system, in our system, we, we claim frequently there's too much assessment. I think that there's too little assessment. Uh, and the reason for that is we haven't got enough assessment of the right kind. We need rich Q&A in the classroom that probes the understanding of children that probes whether they grasped an idea like conservation of mass or grasped the idea of condensation. Uh, it's this rich probing of their ideas through study of what they say, study of what they do, which should really be behind assessment in the revised national curriculum. We need more assessment of a different kind, much more probing, much more supportive of learning. In going around schools and talking to teachers, I've noticed um, a tendency of teachers to dive down straight into the content of the revised national curriculum to look at what content changes there have been in, say, in a particular year in mathematics. And that is important. You know, the content changes are important. But if you simply approach the changes as a change in the content of particular subjects, you'll miss some of the key ideas that drove the revision of the national curriculum. And this idea of fewer things in greater depth where children have really deep learning and secure understanding of the key ideas, concepts, bodies of knowledge, well, there's a danger of missing that. And we really, when we, when we looked at the, the, the evidence on uh, high-performing jurisdictions around the world, we really spotted this fewer things in greater depth idea. We wanted children not to move with undue pace through the content of the national curriculum. Assessment should be focused on establishing whether a child is secure and deep understanding 
of the particular ideas appropriate to them at that stage of their learning. If they have insecure understanding and they move on, then their overall progression through education will be prejudiced. What we need is clear, progressive statements in the national curriculum. Those statements focusing on key ideas, key concepts, the assessment being focused on those. Has a child grasped these in sufficient depth and with security so that they are ready to move on to the next phase of their learning? And that's a fundamental change, not just a change in content. What I'd like to emphasize is, is a rather odd idea, but the idea of production. In really good schools, outstanding schools that are where children are progressing well and attaining high standards and where equity is high, children produce a lot. That sounds terribly reductivist, but it's not. Children are producing statements. They're making claims about things. They're asserting their hypotheses about things. They're producing more things on pieces of paper, writing, diagrams, pictures. Now, if they produce stuff, that stuff can be looked at by teachers, and teachers get an insight through the things that the children are producing, an insight into the mental life of the children. And that's fundamental to assessment in schools. It enables teachers better to support the child, better to understand whether they are ready to progress, better to understand whether they have actually secured deep learning, whether they can apply their knowledge and skills in a broad range of settings, that they have really solid and secure knowledge and understanding. That's what assessment should be about, and this idea of production is quite important. When I go into these schools, these high-performing schools, children are producing a lot. They're talking a lot. They're writing a lot. And that's really good for high-quality formative assessment. Teachers are approaching the changes in the national curriculum as a change of content, and they do have to understand it's a change of approach, a change in underlying ideas about children and about ability. One of the consequences of these changes is that they're going to have to become as experts in assessment in a way in which they have not had to be before. This means they have to think hard about the questions they're going to put to children, about the questions they're going to put to children by speaking to them and probing their understanding, questions they're going to put to them on paper for them to respond to, which really probe their understanding in relationship to key ideas. And in many cases, this, this, these questions are available. We've got GCSE questions floating around the internet from exam boards, hundreds of them. They can be used with kids of all ages. I've used uh, questions from public examinations with very young children. As long as they are aimed at the concept or idea that the child is, 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 is struggling to acquire, they can be used to probe, and s probe understanding and stimulate really interesting discussion about the ideas. Teachers can pick up questions about ideas like the reflectivity of surfaces and, and actually items that, that are typically used in examinations with quite old children can be used with very young children to probe their understanding and stimulate discussion. So in many ways teachers need to become assessment kleptomaniacs. They need to look very broadly on the internet for questions which are focused and valid in relationship to the idea which is the object of study in a particular week or particular month in the school. And these can be used to support learning and to assess whether the child has understood the idea. And this is a really important new approach, I think.